Can y'all hear that? In Chile, on September 11, 1973, Augusto Pinochet launched a military coup against the government of the democratically elected Marxist president, Salvador Allende. As I fled my country shortly afterwards, I could not take much with me. Some clothes, family pictures, a small bag with dirt from my garden, and an old edition of Pablo Neruda's poetry. Like the bag of earth, with Neruda's words, I was taking a part of Chile with me. For Neruda was such a part of my country, such a part of the political dreams destroyed that day. The poet died two weeks after the attack, many say of a broken heart. At the poet's funeral, the left gathered for the first time to mourn their dead and to mourn the death of democracy. If you look at the history of the Chilean resistance against Pinochet, the first public act of resistance was the funeral of Pablo Neruda. It was as if the gods of poetry wanted to say to Pinochet, you're going to meet your match here. Neruda is going to die, and he's going to die in such a way that his words are going to haunt you. They even allow the people to come together and gather courage and shout and speak out. Teníamos todos un miedo compartido, pero además un desafío tremendo, porque era algo que no íbamos a dejar de hacer, ¿no? Y era una forma de presencia. seem to have lost my Zoom screen with what I was going to work on here. But basically, uh, just like I did to start off this documentary, which we first showed in 2004 for the centennial of Neruda's um, birth, I started off um, the biography, um, the introduction to the biography of Neruda describing this funeral as a way to show just how extraordinary and monumental and utterly rare this phenomenon was and how singular it was to Neruda for the circumstances, for his lifelong experiences, for the power of poetry in so many ways. A dictator stopped, at least temporarily, by a poet. And beyond the political, for many people, this march was about Chile's soul, the hope and the pride of the people, and Neruda, their poet, was its catalyst. Now that the military had stripped them of their liberties, he spoke for them, even in death, once more. And that's one thing out of the many different things that we had batted around for this uh, presentation to talk about. With the times we're going through right now, while well, we could talk about Neruda the love poet, Neruda the rapist, and um, Neruda the odes to the wine, um, Right now, I want to focus a little bit on Neruda as a resistance poetry, poet, especially in terms of how you could see or tie, tie into this other book that we just brought out, Resistencia, which again, we're going to have an incredible um, tomorrow with five different women from Mexico um, talking about resistance, contemporary resistance poetry from down here. And just uh, for to set up um, a little more of what we'd like to talk about, what I'd like to talk about, um, and the circumstances of the power of the funeral throughout Neruda's life, he had actively positioned himself to play this role. From his arrival in Santiago in 1921 as a shy, young anarchist, through his sudden designation by the student movement as the voice of his generation, through Salvador Allende's election and Chile's turbulent transition to socialism, despite disturbing acts to other humans and terrible contradictions on his part, Neruda had fulfilled his own sense of the poet's calling as a resistance poet. We'll be seeing this in some, and I hope you can, can hear me right now. Um, we'll be seeing this in some of the clips that I've decided to concentrate on, 
but also this about the funeral to think about that undergirds the biography that I wrote and poetry in general and the impact of poet Leruda. Isabel Allende took the soil of the country she loved. She took, and she took Neruda, earth and poetry, two powerful, enduring sources of identity, inspiration, and hope as seen in Isabel's suitcase, as well as in the continued endurance of Neruda's work. Earth and poetry, grounding yet fertile. Crystallized in Isabel's story with Neruda is a sentiment that runs through Neruda's legacy. That poetry serves as a purpose. Poetry is not only for the elite or for the intellectuals, but for everyone, as we'll see in some of these clips. That Neruda's life is nothing less than a testimony to poetry's power to be so much more than pretty words on paper. It is an essential part of the fabric of human existence, one that mirrors cultures and plays a role in shaping it. Yes, it evokes emotions, but it can also shift social consciousness, sparking both individual and collective change. So because of some of the limp time, that's, that's from the introduction, mainly from the biography, um, not that I'm plugging it, but just if you're interested and want to support uh, King's English and the festival. Um, but because of time's limits and some, some of the photos that we can't use right now, um, again, we're just, and we're also re-editing some of the clips um, for a new version of the movie. I've just selected about 20 more minutes of outtakes from the film. Perhaps they seem a little random, but they do hit, I hope, on that idea of resistencia off the page of the, of the book or of, of, the, of, of the paper and the pen and hitting also on both sides and also hitting on highlighting some of the characters behind the poet that you normally don't get to see. Um, some are just for humor, for vibrance, for vitality. Lawrence Ferlinghetti, for instance, not necessarily talking down that Ruta so much, but poetry as resistance nonetheless, and about fraternity and just as a jewel. All of which I hope will serve as visual touchstones for dynamic Q&A and discussion afterwards. At the end, depending on the timing, I'll get into a little bit about Neruda in Spain. In 1948, when he Mexico, Pablo Neruda, emissary of the ancestral force of poetry, heard the call of Machu Picchu in Peru and came with his green pen and his heart in flames to these inaccessible peaks of the ancient Incas. Neruda then wrote one of his most important works, The Heights of Machu Picchu, which consists of 12 linked poems building to a monumental crescendo. The problem of the future in our world and in yours is man in himself. In my poem, The Heights of Machu Picchu, I use a vision of ancient men to understand the men of today. From the Inca to the Indian, from the Aztec to the contemporary Mexican peasant. Our homeland, America, has magnificent mountains, rivers, deserts, and mines rich in minerals. Yet the inhabitants of this generous land live in great poverty. What then should be the poet's duty? Sube a nacer conmigo, hermano. Dame la mano desde la profunda zona de tu dolor diseminado. Yo vengo a hablar por vuestra boca muerta a través de la tierra junto a todos los silenciosos labios derramados y desde el fondo habladme toda esta larga noche como si yo estuviera con vosotros anclado contadme todo cadena a cadena eslabón a eslabón y paso a paso afilad los cuchillos que guardasteis ponedlos en mi pecho y en mi mano como un río de rayos amarillos como un río de tigres enterrados y dejadme llorar horas, días, años, edades ciegas siglos estelares dadme el silencio, el agua, la esperanza dadme la lucha, el hierro, los volcanes Apegadme los cuerpos como imanes, acudid a mis venas y a mi boca, hablad por mis palabras y mi sangre. Ah. 
heights of Machu Picchu would be included in his great book Canto General, an envisioned epic poem of the history of the Americas. It is a communist and humanitarian interpretation of human struggle for justice in the new world. It would be banned in Chile, but Neruda's friends, Diego Rivera and David Alfaro Siqueiros, would paint an extraordinary edition in Mexico. El compromiso político de Neruda es anterior al canto general, pero en canto general esta, este intento de describir la geografía y la historia está hecho desde, el punto de vista, desde un punto de vista que entiende la historia como un conflicto de clase. Y en ese sentido se trataría de un libro político y se trataría, o podría hablarse, de un libro en que hay... Eh, en que existe la presencia eh, de la visión marxista de la historia. Bueno, de Neruda tengo varios libros. De Barría tengo lo, lo que nos falta nunca, es 20 poemas de amor, Residencia en la Tierra, Confieso que he vivido y Canto General, que es mi preferido. ¿Y por qué Canto General? Bueno, Canto General es, eh, es, la, parte, es, es la parte combativa de Neruda. La importancia del Canto General es que nos revela a nosotros la historia americana desde un punto de vista diferente, el punto de vista de, que, de los pueblos mismos, no la historia contada por los vencedores, sino podríamos decir la historia contada por los vencidos. When he hit the target, which he, he did 98% of the time, or 95% of the time in the Canto General, what he did is he redefined what America meant. America, even North America, particularly Latin America. And, and I live, I still live, and I think many of us still live inside the world that he discovered. He basically named Latin America in a new way. And he claimed for Latin America the possibility of being lyrically and epically in a story of resistance. And what I think is very special about that, what was very special for me, was that he managed to understand that the struggle of the people for their liberation, for their full humanity, was parallel to the struggle of the nature of Latin America to be expressed, to be freed in some sense, to be freed, to be shown. Neruda once wrote, on our earth, Before writing was invented, before the printing press was invented, poetry flourished. That is why we know that poetry is like bread. It should be shared by all, by scholars and by peasants, by all our vast, incredible, extraordinary family of humanity. Returning to his native land in 1945, Neruda joined the Chilean Communist Party. No es el partido que buscó a Pablo. Pablo vio al partido. Y al tomar Pablo partido por la paz, contra el fascismo, por los pueblos. The party asked Neruda to run for the Senate from Antofagasta, the desert copper mining province of the north. He supported the miners' organizing efforts and wrote about their struggles. The workers elected Neruda as their senator. But by 1947, the chill of the Cold War was already being felt in Chile, and the president, Gabriel González Videla, cracked down on the left, a group whose votes helped put him into office. The Cold War had an ideological influence on González Videla, who decided Chile could not be aligned but with the United States. There was a time of some kind of fever, uh, anti-communist fever. Neruda accused his president of selling out to the United States. Videla crushed strikes and imprisoned hundreds of labor leaders and intellectuals in what Neruda called Nazi-style concentration camps. One of those camps would be used by the Pinochet regime 26 years later. Neruda wrote a long letter describing the situation titled The Crisis of Democracy in Chile is a Dramatic Warning for Our Continent. It was published in a Venezuelan newspaper and addressed to all the people of Latin America. 
As Videla tried to impeach Neruda for his statements, the poet responded on the Senate floor, accusing the president of many abuses, such as his use of the military against workers. Videla ordered his arrest, and Neruda fled into hiding. And there was a very strong campaign in the press against Neruda, and all the time saying his, uh, his arrest is imminent. He was in different houses, 11 houses, with my, according to my count, y entre las casas a que llegó él, estaba el departamento que nosotros vivíamos, en el parque forestal. Nosotros éramos militantes del Partido Comunista, y entonces él, naturalmente, el partido fue el que lo, lo llevó allá a él, para quedarse con nosotros. Y pensaba que Pablo ya era un, un, un monumento. Entonces yo creí que, iba, eh, 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 que el hombre iba a ser difícil, que iba a ser eh, distante, que iba a ser eh, inaccesible en muchos aspectos, que él era un gran intelectual, era un, un tipo que ya se había destacado mundialmente. Y la Delia también, era, era una reina del mundo, pero no. Era la gente más espontánea, más sencilla y más bondadosa. ¿Aceptaron? No aceptaron que nosotros le dejáramos la pieza grande donde teníamos una cama doble. Se fueron a dormir en la cama de la guagua, que era una cama de una plaza, y donde dormían estrechísimo, según Pablo, como cucharita. There was a very big mobilization of police agents to look for Neruda. 63 places at least were uh, searched. No longer safe in his own country, a plan was devised where Neruda would head to the south to escape into Argentina. arrived at a remote ranch where the foreman was a member of the party. Lo tuvo en la casa de mi suegro, lo tuvo ahí, porque a, ella, a la firma llegaba mucha gente, carabineros, llegaban ahí, por eso lo consiguió con mi suegro para tenerlo allá. Ahí tuvo más de 20 días en la casa de nosotros, del suegro, yo volvía a estar aquí ahí también. Él escribía así desde el día, en el día, solía estar escribiendo en las que tenía ahí. Nosotros les solíamos enseñar a andar de caballo, todos creían que la habíamos pasado por acá, porque por aquí para allá también hay pasada, pero era muy mala la pasada allá en esos tiempos. O sea, la nieve, así que nosotros abríamos camino en la nieve y ahí pasábamos. Y él pasaba de tráfico nosotros. Le pasábamos tirando el caballo sin nosotros. Se reía después. <ríe> Ustedes son alentados, hombre. <ríe> Me han cuidado hasta decía. They spent the first night on the trail at a natural hot spring. Under the astral skies, they played guitar and sang folk songs with a small group of wassos, Chilean cowboys, who had ventured down from the hills.
After two days, the riders successfully traversed a clandestine indigenous Mapuche pass into Argentina. In Buenos Aires, Neruda borrowed the passport of Guatemala Nobel laureate Miguel Ángel Asturias and crossed the Atlantic to France. Pablo Picasso was the first to meet him. It was late April 1949, and he arrived just in time for the Congress of Partisans of Peace in Paris. There, Picasso announced to the Congress that he had a surprise and dramatically revealed Neruda to the distinguished crowd, which included Diego Rivera, Langston Hughes, and Charlie Chaplin, two founding members of the surrealistic movement, Paul Eluard and Luis Aragon, and the famous American actor singer, actor, and advocate of civil rights, Paul Robeson. The Chilean government denied the news that Pablo was in Europe and said they were hot on his trail. Borrowing from Mark Twain, Neruda told the press, say that I'm not Pablo Neruda, but another Chilean who writes poetry, fights for freedom, and is also called Neruda. Muchas generaciones de chilenos que, que digamos, se sienten interpretados por él, por su poesía. Ya sean los chilenos románticos, los chilenos combativos, como fue él. Y es parte de nuestro legado nacional. Neruda nos representa a todos, no solamente al trabajador, representa al estudiante, a la doña de casa, al ejecutivo, tal vez, que se sienta atraído por la poesía. He was so uh, heavy looking, you know, like a Buddha. His poem, they were so light and so and they elevate the spirit so much that was my first uh, impression the contrast he has an incredible sense of humor you know? he was always making fun and uh, uh, and he liked it to be with people who enjoy life uh, so the meeting at his house they were very uh, with a lot of fun he liked it to eat to drink to enjoy life and you can see that in his poems. Doesn't impeach that. He can speak of some very painful moment too. Uh, I think every man, every poet, every painter has many currents in his work. Some are painful, others are gay. Uh, I think the, the human mind is very complex and I think that would make Neruda a great poet. Era muy bonito su tu verso, poesía, Me todo. gustas cuando callas, porque estás como ausente. Hasta ahí llego, pero es un libro muy bonito. Pablo Neruda es el inheritor del the greatest poet del 19th century, Walt Whitman. He es el one who named, named the elements of democracy, laid out the dream. I think Pablo Neruda was the, the great inheritor in the 20th century. I feel that he was the great poet, the one who named the things of the 20th century. Do you feel that he is the great namer of the world? Well, Neruda, yeah, yeah definitely. He really is the one who puts the name to Followed the at some distance by Ernesto Cardinal. Yes. Ernesto, I must say, you look a bit like him today. You know, I was sitting over there. My <laughs> oh, let was, me tell the story. When Ernesto <laughs> came here about a month before the Cuban uh, insurrection started, uh, he, he wanted to go to the Army-Navy store. He went to the Army-Navy store. He bought a dozen berets. I should have known something was up. <laughs> <laughs> he was a guy who was always involved with experiment. Uh, I mean, what could be more experimental than writing a poem to a piece of celery uh, or a tomato? The whole poem is based on a tomato. That's an incredible, that's an incredibly experimental thing to do, contentually wise. But he also wrote the poem in a very experimental way. With a political undertone. About yes, of course, with political, because it, it all was political. You mean he threw the tomato? <laughs> <laughs> Allen Ginsberg and I took our first trip out of the country as poets in, earlier in 1959 to um, uh, an international literary convention in Concepcion, southern Chile. 
and uh, it was a, a, a conference organized by the Communist Party. Uh, we didn't know we had been invited by the Communist Party till after we got there. It happened that Fernando Alegria, who had invited us personally in San Francisco, was had a brother who was a functionary in the Communist Party in Chile, and that's how it happened. And so when we were in, in Concepcion, we were taken one day, uh, many of the delegates from all over the world were taken down to the coast to the mining town of Lota, L-O-T-A, where they were undersea mines, and they timed it so that we would be there just when the miners came up in, in elevators out of the ground from undersea. And uh, so the, the miners came up in these, in these sort of cage caged elevators and they were all uh, covered in black with coal dust and soot and the, the, the press stuck the, their microphones in our faces and says well what do you think of that these miners get uh, they've been underground for 10 hours and they get a dollar a day what do you think of all that so everyone of course expressed their shock and, and uh, made big headlines in the press the next day what all the international literary figures had said. They sent out, the conference sent out a questionnaire to all the delegates asking them a whole series of questions about the conference, such as what was uh, the, most, the most important event to you at this conference, and uh, I answered the, the miners in their cages at Lota. Uh, the next question was, uh, what do you think was the most important theme that was broached, uh, discussed at the conference? And I said, the miners in their cages at Lota. And so there's about 15 questions. I had the same answer for all of them. And it was published in the, with all the other people's responses in the, the big daily in Santiago. So that was a little sampling. Um, I did want to keep hitting on resistencia, but also at the same time, give everybody a chance to kind of see some of the stuff that you don't normally see um, or know about with Neruda. Um, a lot of it, you know, every time I look at it now, we filmed this in 2004. Um, the biography didn't come out until 2018. So over that span, I had learned so much and discovered so much. And there's definitely, it almost seems, some of the stuff seems a little almost hagiographic. And part of that is because of some of the interviewees were his very close friends. Um, and I don't think tonight is, we, we, we can definitely not, um, opposing getting into that at all. But, um, you know, there is that darker underside, the truths of Neruda that's not always out there, that are a very important element to learn about this that doesn't totally get shown in this version, which is one of the reasons we want to do another version. A lot of that, again, not to pitch this, but for um, to support the festival. Um, a lot of that is in, in here, including how he raped um, women, how he treated women, um, his narcissism, his contradictions, and also how the generations today look in the Ruta, which is kind of almost a different thing, but um, not as the people of Isabel Allende's generation or the people who were at the funeral in 1973 see him. I, I do want to close before we get into hopefully a, a discussion and anybody uh, we also uh, threw out the idea if anybody wanted to read a poem that uh, we might uh, entertain that but um, in terms of his resistance poet and, and this kind of goes back to the, the um, poetry of resistance book this just came out from Tin House Press um, it's got at least one poem of um, from every country in Latin America representing different themes of, rep of uh, 
Resistencia, whether it's Neruda in his poem I'm about to read about the Spanish Civil War or about indigenous issues, ecological issues, feminist issues, which you will um, have the chance to see tomorrow at the festival. Um, just a whole array of all the different issues that poets have been responding to in Latin America, in that ecosystem within a hundred, the past hundred years. It just came out um, less than a month and the reception has actually been really amazing. Um, you can go to Red Poppy dot net uh, for more information or just uh, look up online Resistencia if you're interested in more information and get a live um, taste of five contemporary poets from Mexico, female poets talking about Resistencia Feminista mañana. Um, I believe, Willie, that's at, at five o'clock Eastern, three o'clock um, uh, Mountain. I'm so bad with time. Right. So Great. Um, but in terms of ending with Neruda and is, is the idea of resistencia and how kind of it wrapped in with all of this, um, again, and this is also somewhat talking about why not to love poetry. At no time was the relationship between Neruda's poetry and his experience of social upheaval, um, whether it was what happened in, in Russia, whether it's what happened and, you know, again, the, the resonance between him on the Senate floor talking to the president, using poetry and using his position as a poet senator to today, it's just, it keeps going. But um, it's never been so directly on display than at the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War. Neruda arrived in Madrid in 1934 as a Chilean consul, just before his 30th birthday. The Spanish monarch had finally fallen just about three years earlier in an idealistic progressive spirit just invigorated the writers, the intellectuals, I hate to use that word, but um, the artists, and especially the poet and the playwright Federico Garcia Lorca. Neruda had just met the year before when actually Neruda was serving as consul in Argentina and Lorca was um, doing her of Bodas de Sangre, his play there. Lorca was waiting at the train station for Neruda when he first arrived in Madrid. Um, and Neruda was also at this point, it's very important to know that he was emerging from this tortuous period of depression and isolation, what he called luminous solitude as he described it as a chapter in his um, title of the chapter in his memoirs that he underwent while serving in a series of consular posts in East Asia just before this period. He was so thirsty for fraternity. His poetry had become deeply introspective during that period. Again, this is following, just to give a little backstory, this is following the success, but not the monetary success of 20 Love Poems of, of more of 20 Love Poems, 20 Love, 20 Love Poems of more, um, 20 Love Poems and a Song of Desperation, uh, which he probably but it you know brought him fame but not money he had two other books that didn't bring him fame and so a lot of Latin American poets at that time were given posts in faraway places um, and Neruda was in Far East Asia and his poetry there became deeply introspective during this period though he wasn't just forced focused on his inner life because while he was serving in his counselor post and off the written page, he actively participated in denigrating and subjugating women, native people of color, and the poor. Years later, in his memoirs, he himself even described raping a Tamil serpent, servant in Sri Lanka, adding another disturbing layer to his future legacy as an activist on behalf of the oppressed. A little bit of what I was hinting at. But when he arrived in Madrid, Neruda's spirits were invigorated by this thriving, exciting fellowship of activists and artists. Yet Spain's social and political situation was tense and complicated. As Hitler and Mussolini gained power nearby, Spanish fascists asserted themselves more directly and violently. The progressive government struggled to survive. Rumors of a fascist revolution swirled, petrifying Lorca, who was gay and a leftist and had become increasingly outspoken in defense of the Republic. He fled to his hometown of Granada, hoping his influential conservative family would protect him. On July 17th, just as bells outside ring, here in Mexico, 1936, the fascist general Francisco Franco led a military uprising, sparking the Spanish Civil War. 
Mussolini and, Hit and Hitler supplied him with planes and weapons. The insurgents, known as the Nationalists, advanced quickly towards Madrid, Madrid, where Neruda and his friends were living, and beginning to take up creative resistance activities. A month into the war, Nationalists arrested Lorca. When asked what crime Lorca committed, charge answer. He's done more damage with a pen than others have with a pistol. Three days later, Lorca and three other prisoners were shot beside a stand of olive trees. The news shook Neruda to the core, everybody to the core. Beyond the horror of a friend's assassination, Lorca's death represented something more. Lorca was an embodiment of poetry. It was as if the fascists had assassinated poetry itself. Neruda had reached a moment from which there was no turning back. His poetry had to shift outwardly. It had to act. No more melancholic verse, love poems dyed with red poppies, or metaphysical writing, all of which ignored the rising fascism. Bold, repeated words and clear, vivid images now served his purpose to convey his pounding heart and to communicate the realities he was experiencing in a way that could be understood immediately by a wide audience around the world. This is nowhere better exemplified than in his poem, I Explain Some Things. The title alone conveys the poem's urgency to be heard and understood. And he wrote this right within the beginning of the war. I'm gonna read about uh, maybe three quarters of it. You will ask, and where are the lilacs? And the metaphysics laced with poppies. And the rain that often be his words, filling them with holes and birds. I'll tell you everything that's happening with me. I lived in a neighborhood of Madrid with church bells, with clocks, with trees. From there you could see the dry face of Castilla like an ocean of leather. My house was called the House of Flowers because everywhere geraniums were exploding. It was a beautiful house with dogs and little birds little kids. Raul, do you remember? Do you remember Rafael, Federico? Do you remember from under the earth? Do you remember my house with balconies on which the light of June drowned flowers in your mouth? Hermano, hermano, everything was great voices, salty goods, piles of throbbing, throbbing bread, markets of my Guayas neighborhood with its statue, like a pale inkwell among the carp. Oil flowed into the poles of feet and hands of the streets. Meters, liters, sharp essence of life, piled fish, texture of rooftops under a cold sun that wears out the weather vane. Fine delirious ivory of the potatoes, tomatoes repeating all the way to the sea. And one morning, everything was burning. And one morning, the fires were shooting out of the earth, devouring beings, and ever since then, fire. Gunpowder ever since, and ever since then, blood. Bandits with airplanes and with moors. Bandits with fingerings and duchesses. Bandits with black friars making blessings kept coming from the sky to kill children. And through the streets, the blood of the children ran simply like children's blood. Facing you, I have seen the blood of Spain rise up to drown you in one single wave of pride and knives. Traitor generals, behold my dead house. Behold Spain destroyed. Yet instead of flowers from every dead house burning metal flows, yet from every hollow of Spain, Spain flows. Yet from every dead child rises a rifle with eyes. Yet from every crime bullets are born that one day will find the target of your heart. You will ask why his poetry doesn't speak to us of dreams, of the leaves, of the great volcanoes of his native land. Come and, see, come and see the blood in the streets. Come and see the blood in the streets. Come and see the blood in the streets. Thank you.
So again, we could look at a whole progression within everything that we showed before. We didn't even talk, I didn't show really anything about the love poetry, but how the love poetry, the surrealistic poetry, and then this, and then what came past, and then also what kind of came with some undercurrents, but that's for a two or three hour or broken up, or a couple books if you'd like, or a whole movie when it comes out in a couple of years, hopefully. So. Yeah, we're definitely <laughs> excited for the movie to come out. Um, how far do you think you are away from that? Uh, <laughs> um, far. It's um, it's a question of actually not too far. To, to, to be honest, now that Resistency is done, I'm working on another book. It's somewhat of a question of money. It's always a question of money with film and documentaries compared to just writing, which it doesn't cost anything to sit for an hour and write and read. Um, but there is a question of money. It's also a question of getting the right personnel to get the right script and the right interviews again to, again to do it. I mean, people, I, I you know, um, for what it is, the documentary as it is from 2004 still works on a lot of levels, but I, I just think it can be so much deeper and take what I wrote, which, you know, again, hopefully would be, people would just enjoy or have enjoyed uh, the biography just for what it is. But when you add the visuals to something like a book, a, a poet or an artist, I think it can just become so much more vivid as you could see in some of the stuff where we didn't even in those scenes really include some visual instances we did. Uh, it's just a matter of time and patience and priority and anybody who wants to get involved, uh, redpoppy.net or just find me, Mark Eisner, and um, we're looking for whatever type of help in any way. Yeah, it's definitely like a lion's mountain worth of work. So props on doing all of that. We're going to move over to the discussion portion of the evening. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Or if you're feeling especially brave, you can turn on your mic and your microphone, uh, your video, um, and ask the question yes directly to Mark. I'm going to start yes with like a pretty basic question that um, should kind of um, spark a little bit of interest. But like Mark, how did you get started with this project? What drew you to Neruda? Um, he has such a vast body of work not even including like the critical scholarly stuff around it that I just imagine that like even attempting to must be very intimidating and daunting. So like even the choice to be like, yeah, I'm gonna try to do this um, seems really intense. So what kind of drew you to it? What convinced you? Because I imagine for a portion of time you were reading a bunch of Neruda and were like, you know, I don't need to write a book on this. I can just enjoy this. Um, so like what drew you to like commit to this like, you know, mammoth of a project? Uh, well, I mean, maybe to take it back a little, um, you know, for so many years I've been working on Neruda. I had a set of wavy curly locks before this all started, and um, I can't tell if anybody was laughing at that, but um, the, uh, um, it's been, you know, it's been for over 20 years, not every day working on it, but now I can see really laughing a little from that. But, um, you know, so many times people are like, God, how can you love Neruda so much? How can you keep working on him? What is it with you and Neruda? Blah, blah, blah. But like, um, it partly really started, it was more of a like step by step. And it started again with what I was just reading from was the Central Neruda. I had been backpacking down in Latin America in 97, 98, 99. Actually, right, I'm in Mexico right now. It started here. Um, and then eventually in Chile and, and Southern South America, and I had always loved Neruda as one of the poets I had been in Latin America with before. And, um, him um, in this book of translations, bilingual in my backpack, and to make a little short, I ended up being on a ranch in Southern Chile, and I just got into the art of translation and me getting to a point with my Spanish, which has always for various reasons not been as great as one would think. Um, and just seeing different things that I was finally able to see once I got to a level of Spanish proficiency, where it's like I could touch the core of Neruda in a way that I couldn't base with basic language, with my basic um, or my more basic Spanish. And one thing or another that led to this idea of doing a new book of, of a collaborative process with eight different uh, translators. Somehow City Lights ended up uh, deciding to publish it. Um, and this is, you know, I just for my, you know, you saw 
Jack Hirschman and, and, and Lawrence Ferlinghetti in City Lights Reading Room, if they had just printed one copy of this, I always say I would die happy. Um, and then at the same time, I was in San Francisco, 2004, the centennial. I wish I knew for better or for worse the, how the idea of getting a documentary came into the head, but it got there. There's people around me. We all decided to do it, kind of a project. Uh, Isabel Allende somehow signed on. She was in, up in, in Rennes County. And after that, um, the centennial, all the words, me getting more and more into Neruda, but also wanting to take a break. But uh, the, the, the introduction really deals with this a lot about why the, the documentary, but an agent approached me in 2005. Again, this book was published, the biography wasn't finished or published until 2018 um, to see about if I wanted to write a documentary. And there was a lot of thinking, a lot of talking to people. And I realized there was a lot of reasons to do that for one reason or another. Um, and hopefully it's, it's proved, proven true. Whether there's a reason to do another, doc, another documentary, I don't know about that. But for that, I think I'm done with Neruda. Thank you for that answer. We got the chat blowing up with a bunch of questions. So I'll just get started there. We have one of our good friends, Nano from Sugar House Review, asking a really important question. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on starting conversations about positive affect slash outcomes set against problematic personal history, specifically contemporarily when cancel culture is a powerful influence. Um, so you had mentioned a lot of problematic aspects of I lost your audio at, at the end. I don't know if I was just the only one, but um, but uh, to, to take to take that basically, when the book came out uh, and I was on tour with it and talking to a lot of people, um, it was a major theme because this had no idea it would happen at the same time. It was pure coincidence, but of course, the book coming out in two thousand eighteen um, was at the same time that the Me Too issue was on the forefront. Um, and my, I wanted to, there was a lot of things that were somewhat evident in Neruda's history, personal history, which I, it wasn't that I discovered that some of the stuff comes straight from his memoirs. The, 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 the rape of the Tamil servant and all his behavior in the Far East is what he writes in his memoirs, which came out when I was the year I was born, 1973. And through all these years, I'm not saying I'm the first person at all because a lot of people recently had been coming up with this too. But it's how do you examine this? I mean, I guess to, 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 this could be a 40 minute conversation and, and without giving all, the, having talked about the back history of all the different problematic things, whether how he talk, talked about the colonialists, how he talked about his opium use, how he inserted himself as a people's poet while not being the people's poet. To me, I'm not into the cancel culture in terms of this. I just, my job I felt was to put out all the information that I could find in the most objective way to put the context around it. That was my, one of my main um, goals as a biographer was not only to write a compelling narrative that would bring Neruda to life and bring all these issues. And one of the things I did was important and it's important to this question is getting back to why this biography was because one of the things I really wanted to do was unlike any other biography before, was show how his political life, his personal life and his poetry, each of those strands were totally intertwined and you can't separate them and to look at their relationship between the three of them. And so I guess I didn't wanna say no I mean, and, and I end. The, I was almost going to read from the the end of the epilogue tonight, but that you know, no, you shouldn't read Neruda because he wrote that he himself was a racist, or that we know he did these awful acts, or that he was a Stalinist, um, and however you want to judge why he was a Stalinist, um, but more just to give the information for somebody to appreciate and understand it themselves, and then evaluate whether like some people I know, some reviewers who review the book favorably. And I, I say that in the context that they review the book favorably, but then they said at the end that they threw out all their Neruda books from their bookshelf after reading the book because they hated Neruda so much after reading it, but they appreciated 
reading the book and the experience and learning all about that. And for me, it's the whole, you know, it comes down to the cancel culture and this question, it's, you know, do you, how do you separate the, the, or do you separate the art from the artist? Um, and I don't think it's my job to do that. I think it's my job to give you the information um, that you might not have known and to give you the context to best understand it and then to best do what you want. I mean, I can't watch Seinfeld right now these days because of Michael Richards um, and his, you know, how he acted afterwards. It, it, it gets in every, there's, you know, 20,000 examples and the root is just one, but this book and others have been bringing to light different aspects. And again, I think I just hope that the person will take in the full context and then it's totally, of course, their total right, whether or not to read Neruda, whether to shame Neruda. For instance, one little thing on this, the, you know, Chile, any country is all about tourism and stuff like that. They want to rename the airport, the Pablo Neruda airport, but there was such a backlash from feminists and other people um, and somewhat anti-communist that they, basically forced the government not to name the airport Pablo Neruda Airport. I mean, here's the, you know, we just talked about the, the, the funeral and the importance of that, but here's the separating the artist from the art and the symbol of the country. And they are like, you can't name our airport, our, you know, Santiago's airport, the main airport after a rapist. And went out in Congress, so. Yeah, thank you for diving headlong into like a very fraught and complicated question. Um, there's definitely a lot to chew over there. I'm going to move over to Maria Toledo's question, which is, have you ever visited his houses in Chile? Um, yeah, and it was a real shame about picking the stuff tonight in terms of one thing we mentioned was about the rights. Um, and just for very, not to get into a whole story, but that I, um, I have some amazing footage. There's one thing I have amazing footage for the film, including friends of his, including the construct, the person who worked on his famed house in Isla Negra um, for years, uh, interviewing him there. But I also had the personal experience of, um, because of how I got into the Neruda Foundation, all the work I did over the years, being able to kind of have these intimate experiences of being at the houses. His house, Neruda has, for a communist not too shabby, he had three houses. One in, um, and this is another thing you can debate why a communist, why anybody would have three houses, um, uh, or people's poets having three houses. He had the spectacular legendary coast, Isla Negra. He had the top of this small house in the port town of Valparaiso up the coast, mainly for parties and to get away. Then he had his main house in Santiago. Um, each of them is just one of those, it's imbued by his poetic touch and the spirit of the people who've been there and the place setting. And so, yeah, I, um, if you can get a message to me, maybe I can get, I don't know if I can really put this out here, but um, there is footage I can show. I talk about it in the book and the experiences there and about the history of the, the, the houses in the biography. And again, the people who he shared the houses with, his affair, for instance, um, with uh, Matilda, his great muse, his, his famous third wife, um, having an affair with his her niece at Isla Negra when he was dying of prostate cancer in his late 60s. I was almost going to play the clip of him being named to um, ambassador of Chile after Allende won. The reason he was named ambassador of Chile wasn't out of some great duty, as he'd like to say, but it was because Matilde was like, I'm either leaving you or we're leaving this country. You know, I, I caught you red handed sleeping with my 35 year old niece in our fabled house at Isla Negra. And they got the party to name him ambassador to France. Whoa. So. <laughs> um, thank you for that because response, that's, Mark. That's where he was with, um, with his second wife. Uh, so <laughs> there's that too, but. Yeah, I knew of some of the drama, but I didn't realize that it was like full of this much cheese, man. Like, geez. Um, the next question is by Zanis, and she said she loved the story of how Neruda took Asturias' passport and went to Paris on it. Did you say that he met Langston Hughes and Paul Robinson at the same time there? What was the occasion? Uh, and I'd add on to that question. Yes, like in general, what were Pablo Neruda's relationships like to a lot of his contemporaries? Like, 
there's that fascinating relationship between him and Picasso, him and Diego Rivera. I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add on about that. Yeah, I mean, and, and thank you, Sam. I, I don't know, for those who know Miguel, he was a um, uh, no prize winner, um, but you can see even in that picture, even though it's eight, they look like identical. It's really uncanny how, and that's why he had it, got his passport, was they really look just like two great American, um, Latin American poets, just world poets um, from different corners of the Americas. Um, so he did use his passport because it did, um, they, they looked very similar and he could get away with it. And, you know, I, I, that clip got kind of cut off because then it gets into the whole Russia and Europe and exile um, chapter. But I mean, one of the things was that after he was exiled, he went and landed at that. This was this huge, he just happened, I mean, it's somewhat coincidence that the timing was that he landed at this, you know, one of the famous um, world partisan congresses for peace where it was these anti-fascists most of them communists but not all of them communists but you had people from Diego Rivera and all these luminaries all these activists intellectuals and you know Howard Fast I mean to every Paul Edward some of the people I mentioned but just this huge this was at this I forgot the name of it but um, you know, this famous, this was actually where Picasso, it was at that event where Picasso uh, debuted or premiered the Paloma, um, you know, out of the sign of peace or also named after his daughter. Um, and it was just, there's this huge movement of these intellectuals. And again, I have a problem with the word intellectual, but these intellectual activists, like we have Ethelbert Miller here, um, one of the great intellectual literary activists. And thank you so much. It's just so heartening to see you here, Ethelbert. Um, and that's totally out of love and tribute that little comment. Um, but the, you know, the, this great force of people working against fascism in in the 1940s um through congresses through activities through writing and through through um through literary activities of all different kinds and then through diplomatic activities and and you know that's langston hughes paul robeson would be coming over howard fast a lot of others um there's others who didn't come arthur miller was supposed to come to that congress um but uh, the CI or the FBI, I've seen the file. They had a whole list of everybody who was there, of course. Um, but there was this huge, um, this huge movement, a collective movement um, towards peace with the whole, you know, Russia, German, um, and that's partly again where the whole Stalinism comes in in many ways was choosing Stalin over the fact that the the U.S. the Allies and um, and uh, it was Spain, it was Spain, or I'm sorry, it was Stalin who came to the defense, um, to the uh, defense of Spain and the other republics while the allies did nothing. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, this is a fun question and it's by um, Laura Mo. I use a few lines of Neruda's poetry in my novel and they cost me money. Did the Neruda Foundation allow you to use them for free or did you have to pay? Well, Laura, I've read your novel, which I suggest everybody reading it. Um, and um, I had no idea that you had to pay for that. I don't understand how um, how they could how they could do that. So I don't know. I've never had to pay. I mean, I've had to pay, for instance, for rights for the poetry, for rights to filming on the houses, um, for all the literary rights and stuff like that. But that's, you know, for me to write, for instance, a biography, I can write about anything I want to as long as I'm not impeding on his copyrights. Um, and his name's not copyrighted. So I'm not sure how that happened for you in what context that they, that they made you pay for that. Yeah, I had to pay, um, I think it was, I mean, I only used about six lines and it cost me about 250 bucks. Plus I had to pay, I had to send four copies of my novel to Spain. Yeah. Which cost me over a hundred bucks. <laughs> there went my royalties. <laughs> yeah, that's probably more than they've done on a lot of books of poetry that they've, uh, that people have done. So I'm, I'm not sure 
again, I'd have to reread the context in which you use um, his name in that way, unless they taught, thought it was a total commercialization. But I mean, there's so many songs with Neruda, with you know, using Neruda's name and everything, and his his effervescence or, or penetration into the popular culture, where you know they don't own his name. I, I, you're you're free to write a book with Mark Eisner and I, you don't have to get my rights, you know, I mean, so I don't know where that came from. We could, I'd love to talk with you at some point afterwards, because I'd be curious about that. So, yeah, but my, my publisher had me write permission for everything I quoted. So I guess if I hadn't asked, I wouldn't have had to pay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was my fault. No, thank you for that excellent question. Definitely a lot of like fascinating in and outs of like just the literary business there. Um, we got another question by Sandra Georgie. Um, did you get to cover the circumstances surrounding his death? There was a lot of mystery and um, a lot of state drama kind of involved in that. So how did you cover it, Mark? Yeah, I, um, you know, again, some of the fortunes are just, you know, the time of coincidence or whatever of writing a book over so many years. Not only was it that, you know, a lot of my, I brought out a lot of the stuff that ties into the kind of the Me Too movement, it just happened to come out that year. Um, his death, I was writing, I was doing the final report, a kind of autopsy or, or, or uh, trial report of his death came in. And so I was, I put that in as actually as a sub note, or I'm sorry, not subtitle. Um, what's that called when you put footnote um, because I couldn't fit into the text. My, what I talk about in the, in the book and, you know, of course it has got, it got centralized, centralized, centralized all over the, you know, like, like, I don't know. It was just, it was, it was so incredible how people were so interested, but you know, it's like Chilean, you know, love poet, you know, uh, assassinated by or by dictatorship, um, and then these you know false allegations, totally false allegations, made up allegations that had no proof that the CIA was involved. Um, I talked to, I had fortunately I had already been in contact with a lot of experts who who knew what was going on, and it, it comes down to it that um, there is not one single fact that proves or shows that he could have been or was assassinated or assassinated by the dictatorship or anybody within the, the regime. They're all plausibilities. You could say, for instance, the fact that he was dying of prostate cancer, but that he got an injection in the hospital where um, he went because he was sick before the coup, before the coup happened. He moved, he went from East Lanegra into the coast because he was that sick that he went into a hospital in Santiago where he supposedly got this injection and then everybody's like, well, actually the, 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 the post-mortem tests now show that after they dig, dug him up and everything, show that he didn't die of um, cancer, but it was a heart attack or something else, but it wasn't actually cancer, but we know he had cancer. So just because he didn't die of cancer doesn't mean he was assassinated because there's a lot of repercussions that cancer out of a very sick man can, can, can cause. And you can go on and on and on. Of course, they like, they raided everybody's house and they raided Neruda's house, the military afterwards. And there's one thing after another. And, you know, some of the reporting, um, a lot of this came from his driver who I talked to the reporter who first was one of the first people who broke the story or brought it up to the public after many years of this guy saying it. And at the end, he saw that said this guy was a, um, met, I want to say metabolic, metabolic, um, uh, what's the word when somebody is just a, a, an incredible, I can't think of the word, me metabolic liar? That's not, we're not talking about metabolism. Um, uh, but just diabolic liar, just like, you know, that there were so many lies that after he started to listen to the tapes and the whole thing, I, you know, I go through and just kind of say without trying to spend too much time because I don't want to put too much attention to it, even though there is a valid reason to be interested in do it because it's so, you know, salacious. But you know, going back to the beginning of the clip of, of the movie, Neruda's funeral from a natural death was the biggest, most important, and first public display of, um, of resistance against the Pinochet regime. 
everybody who is claiming that he was assassinated, their idea is that Pinochet wanted to get rid of Neruda because he was going to go to Mexico, which there were planes ready for him to go, but that he would become the face of the resistance and help take down the, the, the um, even though he was dying, that he would take down the dictatorship from afar. But so the irony is if you are so believing in, I mean, it's not even irony, but just the fact that, I mean, it's almost a beautiful fact that he wasn't assassinated, but even as just being a poet, without being assassinated, the, the Pinochet didn't have to assassinate. The best thing, it would have been better for them to assassinate them because then he wouldn't maybe have had this, such a powerful protest or, or um, funeral that brought up so much um, protest and, and resistance, uh, naturally, if I articulated that, okay. You articulated that just fine. Thank you for tackling that. Um, we have a little bit more time for questions, so feel free to keep dropping them in the chat. I guess um, one of the questions I've had, you talked a little bit about this, but um, just about the reception of your biography. Um, you talked about the impact it had on some of the critics where they threw out their Pablo Neruda books, but um, any other feedback you've kind of gotten on it? What's its reception been in Latin America and Chile, Argentina versus like the US? Um, you know, I've been, <laughs> I've been so gratified by the the reception, whether by critics or by people I met um, here or there, by some of the people here um, I can see in the crowd, um, and what they've said, how they've helped me promote it um, or spread it. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I mean, it's interesting where, you know, again, when I, I was in Fortunately, I was able to be invited down to Chile in 2018, and like, you know, definitely a lot of articles um, or some of the press and some of the interviews and stuff like that about the book here in the States talked about the, you know, the controversial things. I mean, my, the person who interviewed me that I talked about um, saying how she took down all her, threw out all her Neruda books, you know, um, she said that in a very respectful way, and she started off the interview. I know Mark. I mean, she'd actually interviewed me for in 2004, and I really respect this book. Although we did have this very content, not emotionally charged conversation on the phone, which I just uh, neither of us were prepared for. And she actually brings it up in the interview that where she wanted me to say a little more, and I just couldn't go that extra distance to kind of totally condemn him, like. Um, because again, I thought that it's not my job to say, no, you shouldn't read Neruda or Neruda is this total asshole. I'll say for the record in many ways, Neruda was an asshole, but you know, there's amazing, um, there's so much greatness to him besides him being an asshole. And I'm not going to say right now whether, um, you know, the, the bad things he did or the undercurrents outweigh all the greatness that he did. Um, but I guess the, in terms of the difference, there was, um, when I went down to Chile, which was in 2019, and they were caught up in the whole thing about Neruda and, you know, him leaving his, his, his infant daughter and him leaving his second wife and, and all the scandals, um, that's all they wanted to, in the little interviews that I had, which were some, for some media stuff, it was like these sound bits that they just wanted me on record. Um, to to say one way or the other instead of like getting into like oh how does this north america i mean some interviews did this but how does this person think about neruda in these different ways it was all kind of that sensational thing because they've also been with neruda for so long unlike i mean we have but you know as a national poet this is what they were interested this was what was selling on the media um and i did have with the neruda foundation it wasn't with the neruda foundation but somebody with him kind of that old guard neruda who just totally dismissed the book said i don't know what i'm talking i don't know anything about neruda I, you know, i'm not going to say that yes or no but like because i want to again and you know that this violation was a violation that i didn't abandon his daughter but again it goes to like as much as these negative things are negative and important, you know, some of these, the, the reception like that review totally overshadowed because they wanted to protect their image of, he wanted to protect his image of Neruda um, and who he's advocated Neruda as being an almost, I'll just say it, you know, kind of a sacred cow. And so it overshadows everything else I said. And, you know, I mean, 
you can say I don't know anything about Naruto, but I think I know some things people have said that I do, so. <laughs> Thank you so much for that response. Um, th there's no more questions coming in the chat, but um, one thing I definitely want to get before we go, um, if you would share your favorite Neruda poem um, and why it's your favorite poem and then maybe read it. I imagine you have it in one of those books close to you. Um, I, I, um, I always say it's like kind of like, I mean, I don't know how you are, Willie, or what, you know, everybody else in the audience, it's like, you know, with all your different music you listen to, and, you know, first of all, yes, I've spent all this time with Naruto, but he's also not my only poet in my head, or the only soundtrack in my head, and it's like, I don't always have one favorite poem, and to get into Naruto's kind of the, the, also the arc of his life, and a little of what we touched on, is that he had so many different poems for so many different occasions. I mean, yes, there are poems that when I am like really, really, you know, sappy and I want a love song and I can go to that, like, then I'll go to that. If, I mean, so many times over the last four years that uh, some of what I read was from about the, um, the, I explained some things was not only from um, the biography, but that was also taken out into a Paris Review thing on resistance under Trump, because that was another thing that happened with this book. It just happened to come out right after the Trump selection, or I helped, happened to finish it right when to 100 days of the Trump administration. And so some poems, like I explained some things with that energetic thing when you're just wanting, it's like when you want to go to Rage Against the Machine or you want to go to like, I don't know, The Grateful Dead. There's so many different songs, like for depending on your mood. Um, let me see if there's a, one I can read to close out on, um, which, um, Let's see if I have time to read this, because it's in the epilogue. And it might be, um, good a lot of what we were just saying was a kind of, um, so this is, the epilogue takes place, or this is set at the, Theater Arto in San Francisco, where we were doing the, the centennial, the, the night of the, July 12th, 2004, the night of Nerida Centennial. We premiered the, the, um, the movie. We had Lawrence Ferlinghetti and all these other amazing area poets. Um, we had music, uh, we had children reading um, poetry. And um, uh, so I'm just gonna jump into the end of the, this, the, the last two pages of the book here. Neruda, mysterious as the sea, as much as we think we know him, as much as we could describe him that night in the reading and the film and music, as much as I try to in this book, we'll never know everything because he wasn't only a figurehead or merely an icon. He was also As the audience watched those waves crashing over the black rocks of Isla Negra, they heard an actor read part of Neruda's poems, Lazy Bones. Working on the movie, I had heard the poem so many times that it had begun to lose its effect on me. But as I listened to it in that packed theater, the word struck me with renewed emotion. Neruda composed the poem overlooking the waves at Isla Negra, not long after the space race had begun. The metal objects he refers to are the new satellites circling above in the night sky. While the possibilities they represent may catch his attention, the poet is still consumed by the beauty right here on Earth. Metal objects will still journey among the stars. Weary men will still go up to assault the gentle moon and install their pharmacies. In the season of swollen grapes, wine begins its life between the sea and the mountains. In Chile, the cherries dance, dusty girls sing, and the water gleams from guitars. The sun knocks on every door and works miracles with wheat. The first wine is pink, sweet as a tender child. The second wine is robust, like the voice of a sailor. And the third wine is a topaz, a poppy, and a fiery blaze. 
My house has a sea and earth. My woman has majestic eyes, the color of wild hazelnuts. While night falls, the sea adorns itself in white and green. And then the moon in sea foam dreams like a maritime drive. I do not want any other planet. And then I just end up the last paragraph. The poem's melody of innocent thoughts and imagery conveys that Neruda's work doesn't always have to be raw with politics or love. That at the heart of it all, his poetry is about the wonder of being human. This is what keeps people coming back to Neruda, the essential poetic expression of what we are at our core, the elementary within the complex, the ordinary and the infinite, the true and the unknowable.